We are so thankful that you've chosen to spend this resurrection day here at First Baptist Church. We're so thankful that we get to have a resurrection day, aren't we? All around the world, people are using a greeting more so today than probably any other day of the year. That One person will walk up to another and say, he is risen, and the other will answer, he is risen indeed. So we want to do that together, okay? We'll do it a couple, three times just to make sure we have it down, and then watch for it. It'll happen throughout the service, all right? He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And aren't we so grateful that he has? Isn't that great news? Let's give him a hand. What do you say? Isn't that great? Guests, we'd love to get to know you and know how we can spur you along and encourage you in, in your journey of faith. And so if you would, at some point in the service, take a moment to fill out that card that's in the pew in front of you and place it in the offering plate. Again, it's, it's not so we can have a record that you were here. It's so that we can come alongside you and encourage you in this journey that we're all on in our faith walk. Now, if you would, uh, get to know some of the people that you're worshiping near because in just a minute, we're going to turn it loose and give God all the glory he deserves. All right, let's do that now. we will all be made alive. We celebrate the resurrection as we sing out the truth. Our Christ is risen.
risen. He is risen indeed. Our Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. As we stand before him this morning, we can know that he brings life, come what may. And we can stand firm in the truth. He is the great I am. Let's worship him as we sing. I want to be close, close to your side. So heaven is real and death is a lie. What and hear voices, see your love, singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee. 
Apostle Paul said that the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is, is the firm foundation upon which we stand. So no matter what comes our way, we can boldly say, I know my Redeemer lives. He is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Ken and choir and uh, our orchestra. Let's open our Bibles this morning to John chapter 20. I want to talk about, of course, Easter, but from, from reservation to resolve. Easter, reservation to resolve. 
The disciples then were no different from disciples today. These disciples, just after the resurrection, were at a place of, of hesitation. They were at a place of, of reservation. They were not really resolved or fixed in their, in their faith as of, of yet. And so it was after the resurrection and after these appearances of Jesus that, that they moved in their life from a place of hesitation to a place of, of being fixed, saying, this is who I am. This is who we are as, as the people of, of God. Jesus said from the cross, as we heard Friday at our Good Friday service, from the cross, Jesus said, and it's documented there in, in chapter 19 in verse 30, the last words of Jesus were these, it is finished. It is finished. Well, what was it that was, that was finished on the cross? Well, the, the revelation of God was, was finished. God had been in the process of revealing himself from, from the act of creation. God had been in this process of revealing himself. That's what revelation is. God in the process of revealing himself and making himself known. He desires to live in relationship with humankind. And so he was, he was very actively through history and through the ages in a process of revealing himself and making himself known. It is finished. The mission of Jesus was finished. It is appointed unto the man, the son of man, to suffer and to die. He came. He knew his, his purpose and his coming and his death upon the cross. He, he recognized that his mission was complete. It is finished. It is finished. The reconciliation of the world, the, the redemptive purposes of God, his plan of salvation for, for humankind in and through the person of, of Jesus Christ, it was finished once and for all. It is finished. The defeat of, of evil, God through the resurrection would say that, that he himself has the final word. Death does not have the final word. Evil does not have the final word in this world. Behold, I am making all things new, the resurrected Christ would say in, in Revelation. And so I hear that, dec that declaration that, that Jesus made, that final declaration, it is finished. But in my reading and in my understanding of what follows in the life of these disciples, never has such a declarative statement that it is finished left behind so much unfinished business in the life of so many. You see, you, you read about these disciples and each one of them had their own experience with Jesus after the resurrection. And they're at a place of confusion. They're at a place of, of not understanding. And, and they do move eventually from a place of hesitancy and, and reservation to a place of being fixed in their faith. But as I, I read this continuing narrative of post-resurrection appearances of Jesus to these disciples and, and really the unique experiences of these unique disciples, certain unique disciples and distinctive disciples, I see in certain ones of them, I see a representation in the life of disciples now. These individuals that, that Jesus appeared to, their, their concerns, their place in life, their station in life, they're seeking to understand. When I look at these pages and I look at the life of these disciples, I see you and I see me. I see people who are, who are confused. I see people that are hesitant in their, in their faith. I see people that, that are not really fixed. People that are, that are kind of unsure, but people that have this desire to truly move to a place of being established of being fixed once and for all in our faith to say, this is who I am. This is what identifies me as, as a person. For instance, I, I know that and I see that there are some of you this, this morning that, that are conditioned like John to believe. John was conditioned, John the beloved, John the apostle, John the writer of, of, this, of this gospel. John, John was a man that was like many of you, who grew up in church, you were, you were conditioned to believe. I want you to see it from, from a perspective that maybe you haven't noticed before, but let's pick it up in chapter 20 and verse one. It says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. 
and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. He's speaking of himself. He's writing in the third person. The disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple, John again speaking of himself. So Peter and John, the other disciple, went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were were running together. I almost get a sense as this passage continues, there's a little one-upmanship between, between Peter and John. We, we see that when the Lord pronounces what's going to happen to Peter, he's concerned about what's going to happen to John. There may have been some competitive tension there between who was going to be the closest to Jesus. But I love this verse 4. It says, the two were running together and the other disciple, speaking of himself again, the other disciple ran, ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. I beat him. I run faster than he does. I guess he's trying to cover up his braggadociousness by talking about this other disciple when he's talking about himself. The two were running together and the other disciple ran ahead faster and Peter came to the tomb first. Now jump down to verse 8. So the other disciple is talking about, about John speaking of himself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed had you even noticed that passage of scripture before most of us think that that it was Mary that was the first one to believe but here John says that that he believed he looked in the tomb I beat Peter the tomb I got there first I went in it I went in I saw that 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 the body wasn't there I saw that the burial clothes were were arranged in in such a way And based upon what I saw, based upon the evidence, I believed. Now, John, being a good good Jew, he was conditioned to believe. I see John is one who was brought up in a strong strong Jewish home. A home where, where faith, their faith defined who they were. They were of the lineage of of Joshua's decree. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. John's brother was James. These were the sons of Zebedee. History says that they were the cousins of of Jesus. And so they they grew up in a culture, in an environment, in an incubator, if you will, where faith could be nurtured. He was conditioned to believe this is what you're to look for. This is what the Messiah is going to be about. This is what's going to happen when the Christ comes. And based upon the evidence he saw, unlike Thomas, who we'll see in just a moment, based upon what he saw and what he understood about the teachings of the Old Testament, he believed. It was conditioned within him. Now, I hate to say this, but there are pros and cons to growing up in church. As someone who didn't grow up in church, I can tell you that I have many advantages over those of you who did. By the same token, there are some of you, and probably most of you, I would say, that did grow up in church. You have advantages that that I don't have in the life of faith. But part of what I see in the life of those that you really have to battle, what I see in the life of many who grew up in church is that you have to be very intentional. You have to labor very hard at not taking faith for granted. You can become so overly familiar with the things of God. We, we live in a country, we live in a place where we have the freedom to, to worship. We have the freedom to assemble together. These are things that, that we take for granted. And the gospel and the teaching of God's word is something that, that, that just becomes, that becomes very familiar. You hear all of this about Jesus coming again. You grew up with it and you think, well, he hadn't come in 2,000 years. You know, I'm just going to sow my oats. I'm just going to do my thing. And, you know, maybe I can cover my bases right before he comes. You can become overly familiar with, with the things of God and take for granted what the gospel is supposed to mean. Because you see, there were a great many Jews, and I would say the overwhelming majority of Jews in John's day, they too were conditioned but they were wrongly conditioned in their thinking. Just like I see a great many Western Christians who are wrongly conditioned in their thinking. 
Many of you have been conditioned to think of the Christian faith in, in terms of American capitalism instead of biblical theology. Instead of having a biblical faith, you have many have more of an American faith that as long as you love God and country, as long as you uh, drive a Chevrolet, as long as you love baseball and apple pie, that these are all just kind of rolled together. And if you embrace those things, well, then, then you must be a Christian. And sadly, many of our churches have conditioned believers, professing believers, to think that way. But we find that it's a far cry from biblical Christianity. It's more of an American Christianity than a biblical Christianity. And there were, there were many Jews in John's day, and I would say most Jews in John's day, that were on the, the negative side of a bad conditioning process because they were conditioned to think of the Messiah as one who, when he comes, he's going to be a political ruler. He's going to be a military ruler. He's going to overthrow Roman oppression. He's going to reestablish the, the throne of David. Israel will once again be a political, socio-economic, militaristic power in the world. They were conditioned for 400 years to think that way. That's the way the scriptures had wrongly been interpreted and preached to them. So that when the Messiah came, because they were so conditioned, they missed it and they rejected him. But apparently John and James were brought up in a good healthy household to live with the anticipation of what God was going to do because I, I want you to see in verse 9 see the uniqueness of what John understands that others do not for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead John understood that that's what he was anticipating the others weren't John was anticipating this, so when he saw the evidence, he believed. And every one of you who are conditioned to believe, every one of you who are raised in church, who were dragged to church by your parents, <laughs> who were made to come, who when you got to college or your young adult years said, man, I'm never going, uh, I, went, I went all my life. When I was a kid growing up, my parents made me, I'm never going up there again. Well, things happen and you eventually come back. I remember when I, when I left the University of Oklahoma, I said, man, I'm never going to work out again a day in my life. I'm never going to have a coach pushing me again in, the day, in a day of my life. I'm never going to work out again. Well, then your clothes quit fitting. And you think, well, I guess I better start working out again. And when you're young, your parents drag you to church, you get to college, 85% of those who grew up in church in college never go back to church. 85%, isn't that overwhelming? 85% never go back to church in their college years. But what happens is the wheels are gonna start falling off, of li falling off of life. All of a sudden you start feeling vulnerable in life, things start happening in life, and you start looking for something beyond this world. And you find yourself being drawn back and you determine that your faith is going to be your own. See, a lot of times when you're conditioned to become a child of God, when you're conditioned, when you're brought up in church, you eventually come to a place where you have to embrace your faith as your own. Some just ride on the coattails of their parents' faith, their grandparents' faith. But eventually, if, you, if you've been rightly conditioned, you come to a place where you say, you know what? I've either got to embrace this faith as being my own or I'm just going to walk away from it. This is either going to define who I am or I'm going to reject it completely. Some of you who are conditioned, some of you today have been fortunate enough to be brought up in an incubator where your faith has been nurtured. Now it's time for it to come forth in birth for it to be birthed in your own heart, in your own life. But you see, there's some other disciples that are in this story as well, and other disciples that, that are in this room, not just those like, like John that have been conditioned, but some of you are here desiring like Mary. You're holding on to hope. You're searching for more. Even though life maybe has taken a twist and a turn that you didn't anticipate, you are hanging on and you are desiring more. You are looking for more. You're expecting more. Notice in verse 11, 
of chapter 20, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. What I want you to notice about Mary is the continuing desiring that she has in her heart. Even though she knew what had happened on Friday, even though she was a witness to, to the crucifixion, even though she was a witness to him being entombed, the text says something very interesting about Mary's behavior when it says, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. In the Greek, it says that Mary was continually there. We don't have an appropriate verb tense in the English, but in the Greek, it's the idea that she was always there. She didn't just show up on Sunday morning, put flowers on the grave. She kept going there. And when she went there, she stayed there. Even though she, she knew there was a body in the tomb, she was desiring something more. She was desiring that something would happen. She was desiring that God was going to move in a way that she never imagined or expected. How many of us are going to have the kind of faith to stand outside a tomb where we know there's a body and expect something like this to happen. It takes a very kind of, of unique faith that even in the, the midst of the most tragic circumstances, the most heart-rending of circumstances, to keep going and to keep searching. But I know that there are people here this morning that out of the brokenness of your lives, that out of the heartache of your life, out of the grief of your heart, like Mary, you have come here on this particular morning and you are desiring something. You are desiring in your heart a resurrection of your dreams, a resurrection of your hopes, a resurrection that will overcome the overwhelming grief of what maybe your circumstances are at this moment. And the resurrection speaks words of hope to us. Some of you here this morning, you're like Mary, you have a desiring faith. Some of you here are like, are like John, you have a you have a faith that has been conditioned. But there's others, others that are here this, this morning. You're like another character here in these, in these narratives. And this is the bulk of, this, of the disciples. And these are the ones who are fearful. The majority of the disciples are just sequestered away. They're, they're fearful. They're, they're afraid of what's going to happen. We see it described in verses 19 through 21. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I also send you. What was Jesus saying? I know why you're here. They were there because of Caiaphas, their fear of Caiaphas, the Jews, the, the, the chief priest. I mean, if they could do this to Jesus, there's no telling what they will do to us. And so here they were sequestered behind closed doors, living in fear, fearful of life, fearful of what might happen, uncertain of the future. And there's some of you here today that are afraid, uncertain of the future. Your heart, your mind, your thoughts held hostage by all the possibilities of bad things that could go wrong out there in the world. 
living life with a sense of fear instead of embracing life as one who has been sent. And to our detriment, the church in the West, the church especially in North America, I see believers, I see Christians, especially those who would call themselves as as evangelicals, I see the prevailing emotion as being fear, sadly. Evangelicals, the ones that are supposedly most out there about, about their faith, those who are out there about their understanding of the exclusive nature of the call of Christ, that Jesus is the way. That there is no other way, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. That those are the ones living most in fear. Kind of entrenching themselves, kind of sequestering themselves away, scared to death of of the world, afraid we might be tainted by those who, who don't believe we had this fear. And, oh, I hope they don't talk to me about Jesus. I hope they don't ask me if I'm a believer. And, oh, we find all these ways of hiding our light under a, a bushel. And that's just, that's the antithesis of what our Lord would anticipate. Here he is, he's saying to a people who are fearful, disciples who are hidden behind closed doors out of fear. He's saying, so I send you as the Father sent me into a place that rejected me, in a place that crucified me. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. The, the, the intent is, is that that we are going to be an offensive people out in the world. I don't mean offending people's sensibilities. I don't mean offending people, though if you live for your faith, people are going to be offended. But I mean offensive in the sense of a militaristic movement. We often find militaristic metaphors that are, that are used in, in the New Testament. Certainly not, not to, to affirm warring nation, between nations. We're, we're, ours is a warring world. But to say that we're a movement. To say that, that we're a people who are out there. Jesus said to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Those are offensive words to be a movement. We can't be stopped. We're to move, we're to spread, we're to be perpetuated into the world exponentially. Not cowering down in in fear. We're a people who who have been sent. And the resurrection comes to say to each and every one of us, let courage come alive. Let courage be resurrected in you. To let your light shine unashamedly out in the world. There was another group of disciples. Isn't it funny how we find ourselves in each each one of these? Because some of us here this this morning, and I and I kind of count myself in in this group. There are some of us here this this morning that that are rationalists. We're rationalists like like Thomas. We see the rationalism of Thomas there in in verse 24 it says but Thomas one of the 12 called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came my question is where was Thomas why wasn't he in church with the other disciples on Sunday where was he it says when you're when you're not in church you miss something Something big happens when, I mean, we were gathered together last Sunday, uh, these disciples might say to, to Thomas, we saw Jesus. Something very formative takes place when, when you're in the rhythm of going to church. Not forsaking the gathering of yourselves together, the writer of Hebrews would say, as has become the habit of some. Because when we, when we go to church, when we, when we gather together with, with the people of God, something very formative happens. When we go to church, we assemble together with the people of God. We find out that we're not alone out in the world. There's there's a synergy. There's an encouragement that comes with gathering together with with the people of God. And then as we sing songs of worship, praise, and adoration, as we hear the word of God taught and, and preached, what we're doing is we're adding a stud to the framework of our lives. You see, every one of us live our life within a certain framework, a certain kind of structure. Every day, we're building a structure in which we're going to build our lives. And so we faithfully, rhythmically, we come to church, we're adding a stud to that frame, to that wall. And when we don't go to church regularly, when it's not a part of of the fabric of who we are, when it's not a part of the rhythm of our life, you know what we're really saying? Well, you know what? That stud right there is not really very important in that wall. The Sunday after that, well, that stud's not very important in that wall. And before long, you've built a structure for yourself that is weak, that is flimsy. 
and then the storms of life come against you and then you begin that whining, oh, why is this happening? Why is my life falling apart? Whereas if you had been in the rhythm of things, in the rhythm of this formative process of what God desires for us to do, you find that you have this structure and this framework that can stand up to the storms of life. But Thomas was a rationalist. Everything that he had believed in, everything he had committed to for the past three years, I saw it, I saw it disappear on, on Friday. The other disciples were saying to him in verse 25, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see, this is a perfect response of a, of a rationalist, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Typical rationalist response. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Good for him. He didn't miss church this Sunday. Thomas was with them this side. Jesus came. There you go. Something good happens. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. You're looking for evidence here, here it is. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they that who do not see and yet believe like, like John. You see, Thomas was a rationalist. Well, our Lord can deal with rationalists. If you're really interested, you can go find, the, you can go find evidence that, that makes faith reasonable. But for a rationalist, he looks back to Friday. I saw the crucifixion. I was an eyewitness. I saw him bleed out. I saw him being beaten. I saw him hung on a cross. I saw him nailed. I saw him bleed out. I mean, I saw what happened. Even Jesus said, it is finished. I heard it from his very lips. It's finished. And he died. But you see what, what I had to learn and what Thomas had to learn and what every rationalist has, has to learn. And, and all of us are influenced by this. We in the West are very much influenced by, by Greek thought. Very linear, A plus B equals C. We, we look for, for logical things. We're rationalists. But you know what Thomas had to learn as, as a rationalistic disciple, what I have to learn, what you have to learn? Is that when Jesus said, it is finished, it means more possibilities than you ever imagined. You see, that was the failure of the Enlightenment project. Dawkins, Hitchens, some of these so-called new atheists who always pointing to the enlightenment as kind of the utopia that we need to return to. If we as humankind are going to progress and go forward, we need to embrace, embrace the rationalistic thought of the enlightenment. And they kind of saw that as a, as a utopian age. Well, if they actually did their homework instead of making such declarative statements that everybody's scared to challenge, they would find out that the enlightenment was a colossal failure. Because even some of the leading personalities of the Enlightenment movement came to a point where they recognized that there are things in the human experience that go far beyond rational thought. There, there, are, there are things in the human experience that go far beyond that which can be seen and proven in the scientific laboratory. Nothing wrong with being rationalistic. Nothing wrong with being a rationalist, someone that likes to see the evidence. My faith is very reasonable. I can make some wonderful, reasonable arguments for my faith. But as a rationalist, I also recognize that in my faith, there are some things that are mysteries. There are things that, that, that transcend my human capacity for understanding. I understand that now I see through a glass darkly. I understand that I live in a tension between the now and the not yet, between the knowing and the not knowing. But for those of us who are rationalists, we have to understand that it is finished means more than we could possibly ever imagine. And there's one other disciple, and that's the one who's grieving. We see him being restored after the resurrection. 
in verses 15 through 17 of chapter 21. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again, a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. We all know what Peter did. Peter denied his Lord three times. The disciples knew what Peter had done. If he was going to be restored because he had denied his Lord publicly, He had to be publicly restored. Don't you know this was the elephant in the room for Peter? Every time he was with the disciples in these post-resurrection appearances, that this was the issue that needed to be addressed. I mean, I'm sure Peter was feeling like a little kid that had been caught by his parents just waiting for the parents' hammer to fall, and they keep delaying, keep putting it off. It's absolute misery when you're a kid. When they know what you did wrong, and you know they know what you did wrong, but they keep holding out on you. Peter had to feel that way. You know, Peter did the worst thing we think a person could possibly ever do, deny his Lord verbally. To be confronted and say, are you a follower of of Jesus? No, I don't know him. And And to do it not once, but to do it three times. But the reality is, is that you and I on a daily basis, through our behavior, through the things we do, through our actions, How often does our presence, does our life say by the things that we do or don't do, how often does our life scream in denial, I don't know the man? And we know it. We know it. We know we've denied him. But the beauty is, so did he. He knew our weakness. He knew our frailties. He knew our shortcomings. That's why he came. That was his purpose in coming. They don't take my life from me. Jesus said, I lay down my life. Don't think that others are in control. I lay down my life and I have, and because I have the authority to lay it down, I have the authority to pick it back up again. I know who you are. I know what you've done. Don't get caught up in the quagmire of failure, but embrace the possibilities of what God longs for in your life. I want you to move past your failures. Don't get bogged down by your failures. Yeah, you're going to stumble. You're going to fall. Pick yourself up. Embrace restoration. Embrace the resurrection of possibilities and go on. That's the life I have for you, going forward, not staying bogged down. I don't want you to live in hesitation. I don't want you to live with reservation. I want you to live in a way that is fixed. I want you to live in a way that is resolute. And if you're still living in a place of hesitation, if you're still living in a place where you're trying to coexist in, in both kingdoms, in, in both worlds, where you're trying to hedge your bets a little bit, if you're still living in that place of, of reservation, I'll see you next year. But if you're at a place that is, that is resolved, if you're fixed and you're resolute, I'll see you next week. And we'll keep going forward together, living the hope of the resurrection. Let's pray. Father, we want to be a people who embrace what you have in store for us. We know that the enemy seeks to hold us hostage. We know that the enemy seeks to beat us down. And yet, Lord, we we come to these passages and we see the resurrection hope that that has been offered to a people that that look an awful lot like us. Hope that has been offered and given to people that, that have experiences seemingly very similar to ours. And so, Father, we find the hope, we find the encouragement to go forward, to be resolved and be to be fixed in our faith and in who we are. 
And Father, as we come to this time of, of invitation, I pray that it might be a time when, when we determine in our own heart, in our own lives, to drive down the stake once and for all, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For more information about First Baptist Church, give us a call or visit us online at firstlubbock.org. Download our mobile app to experience even more from FBC. Check out our other worship times, Sundays at 8.15, 9.30, and 11 a.m. Experience these online or come visit us at Broadway and Avenue V in Lubbock. Thanks for watching. God bless and have a great week.